like the pretty flowers? Is that okay? Okay. I like the, I like the pretty flowers. I want it to be spring already, even though it's like 10 degrees. <laughs> Never mind, I don't want it.
Okay, now you can hear me. Welcome home, children of God. The Lord be with you. I'm Pastor Joe Albright. I want to say a very special word of welcome to those of you who are here as visitors today and those worshiping online. Uh, for those who are here, if y'all would take just a minute and sign the friendship pads found on the inside aisle of your pew, uh, we will pray for you by name later in the week when our prayer team meets on Wednesday. If you have specific prayer requests, uh, you, there's a link online for prayer requests. There's also blue, there should be some blue cards in the pews around you or in the friendship pads. You can write the prayer requests down and drop them in the joy box later or in the offering plate on your way out. We'd be glad to be praying for your specific request as well. I do continue to ask your prayers for, for Patty and Greg, Razor and uh, Ashley. Um, we have a memorial service for Sean Razor coming up on February the 3rd at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It's a Saturday morning. Um, Patty is our church office administrator. But if you're willing to help out on occasion even once a month or so with the slides or with the cameras, uh, with the sound. We would love to train you. Just let me know. We, can, uh, we have a good team, a good solid team, but we could use some more people in the rotation. So give that some prayer as well. Friends, at this point, I'd like to invite you to stand in body or in spirit. We're going to sing together the congregational introit. <clears throat> Please join me in the call to worship. Creator of the cosmos, of eternity, of time, be with us in this time. Savior of the world, healer of the nations, be with us in this place. Breathe of all, breath of all that lives, of people near and far. Stir within our lives. Maker, Spirit, Son, God of here and now. We worship you, O oh God, with all of our hearts.
Please be seated. Jesus told us that the truth will set us free. Friends, now is the time for us to be truthful. Let us approach the throne of grace in humility and in truth. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Oh God, you know us. You know we struggle. We are uneasy. We are often confused. Our life compass spends searching for truth and direction. Help us. Help us to trust in your promises, your faithfulness, and your love for us. Help us to step out in faith and to trust you. As you have blessed us, may we in turn bring blessing to others. We ask you a silent prayers of confession. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Stand. Now let us happily pass the peace of Christ to your neighbor. Okay, you may be seated, and uh, I'd like to, at this time, invite any young disciples who are here to come forward. We'll see. Good morning, girls. So, uh, last week we, we read a psalm, and a lot of times we read psalms in, um, in worship, Psalms were often sung back a long time ago in biblical days. They're still sung today sometimes. And the Psalms originally were written in a different language. They were written not in English, 
but in Hebrew. And I think I shared with you all before a Hebrew word. I don't know if you remember it, Patrice or Olivia, but the word to praise, to praise is halal. Can you say halal? Halal. Right. And, and if you add a, a ooh to the end of that, it makes that word a command. You praise. So we'll say halalu. Can you say that? Halalu. And then the Hebrews would often add to the end of that, you praise, the word Yahweh. Do you know what Yahweh means? What well, was a Hebrew word that they used for God? For God. That's right. They, but they would abbreviate the Yahweh to Yah. So they would say, Hala, halal, lu, ya. Yeah, that means praise God. So we're going to repeat it after me. Hallelujah. You've heard that. You've heard hallelujah. Did you know that it meant praise God? Well, it means praise God. And, and do you know what the word praise means? Well, praise, praise, we, we sometimes we think about it as um, we, we, you know, we, you might praise somebody for something they did, for their kindness. You might praise them for their generosity. You might praise them for their, their inner strength. So we think about God, we praise God for God's kindness. We praise God for God's love for everyone.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, one of the letters of Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the Apostle Paul was writing that letter to a church in the city of of Corinth, which is in modern-day Greece. And the letter itself is is really rich. It's the same letter that we get the beautiful passage on love that's often read at weddings. You know, love is patient. Love is kind. We also have that, uh, the passage about the church being like a body with all the different parts functioning together. And uh, we read about spiritual gifts and the hope of the resurrection. In this letter itself, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a treasure trove of insight into the human condition and the ways in which God in Christ really seeks to come into our lives. However, when we get to the passage that Fran just read, it's, it's a little less straightforward in the, in the background of this, there was a deep-seated belief that really drove everything else. And that is that Paul believed, and these early Christians believed, that Jesus would return at any moment. And that God's kingdom would come within their lifetimes. And this expectation, it really lent a sense of urgency to their lives and their ministries. I'm kind of a sidebar. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that said, Jesus is coming. Everybody look busy. <laughs> and, and it is kind of interesting how, um, you know, a lot of times today we'll hear people say, oh, the, the, end, the end is near. I mean, look at the craziness in the world around us. I mean, all, all these signs, they kind of point, point to Jesus coming again. But people have been saying that since Jesus' time, since Paul's day for sure. And we don't know when. We don't know when. I mean, Jesus himself said, it's not for you to know the times. And about that day or that hour, no one knows. We don't know. But what we do know is that regardless, Paul still hit upon a profound truth here. And that is that the present form of this world is passing away. And whether Jesus came back today or tomorrow or 500 years from now or 5,000 years from now, it is an inescapable fact of life that we don't have forever, that it's all temporal, it's fleeting. We don't know how long we have on earth. None of us know. And with that in mind, Paul writes, let those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as if they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now, I'm not quite sure what to do with all that, but I have a couple thoughts. In Buddhism, you may remember, there are four four noble truths. And the first noble truth is that there is suffering in life. 
Seems pretty obvious. There's suffering in life. The second noble truth is that suffering is caused by grasping or clinging. Because everything is temporal, everything's fleeting, everything's passing when we cling or grasp onto people or things or even ideas when those things pass or crumble or if we lose them or if they fail, we suffer. Now, while it's true, Paul was not writing from a Buddhist perspective, but he does seem to want us to see that the structures of this life are human relationships, our possessions, all of the, our experiences, those that cause us grief and those that give us great joy, all of our dealings with the world are fleeting. They're passing away. And if they're fleeting, if they're passing away, then we want to be careful not to set them at the foundations of our lives. I mean, it's not that we can't enjoy them and love them and appreciate them. It's just that we want to be very careful not to set them at the very foundation. Because what happens if we put the wrong thing at the foundation of our life? Sometime back, a, fr- a friend was telling me about the summer after his father retired. And uh, he said his dad had held a prominent position with a big corporation. And that first summer into his retirement, he, he went into a deep depression. My friend said it was almost as if his dad had woken up that morning, one morning, and he realized he was no longer the chief financial officer. He was simply another retiree at the country club. I mean, his identity had been completely tied up in his work. And when he retired, what was left? You know, some, sometimes we do. We cling to a certain identity, and, uh, and maybe that identity comes from our job or Or what happens to the person whose self-worth is completely based on physical appearance as they age? Or the person whose entire hope for the future is in their IRA when the stock market falls or the medical bills begin to eat up the savings? Paul reminds us that these things are fleeting. We don't know how long they are with us. And again, it's not that they're necessarily bad in and of themselves. In fact, some of them actually make life quite rich. They make life worth living. It's just that Paul desperately wants the Corinthians and us to place our ultimate hope in something bigger. And that is in Christ. Now, clearly, Paul was not saying we are to live without marriage or without rejoicing or without mourning or without possessions. In fact, earlier in this letter, he talks about how husbands have a responsibility to their wives and wives have a responsibility to their husbands and parents have a responsibility to their children. It is important not to lose sight of the temporal nature of all that is. And that's not a cause for despair, but a cause for gratitude. Gratitude that suffering and pain do not get to have the last word. Gratitude that we can, even for a short time, get to experience the beauty of life and love. I, th- I think about my friend Vicki Fry. I remember after she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, we had this conversation, and I remember her saying to me, you know, I I didn't want this. I wouldn't wish this for anybody. But in some ways, it has been a real gift. I have come 
to a much deeper sense of gratitude for all that I have. I mean, I've come to appreciate each meal, each hug from a friend, each visit from my daughter, each moment with my husband. I've come to realize how precious it all is because I don't know how many more I'll get. We don't know how many more we will get. And so we can be grateful for what we do have and the time we've been given. And we can be grateful that ultimately there is one in whom we can place our trust. There is one in whom we can find our identity. There is one who has stood since the beginning of time and who even now is making all things new. And that is Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to invite you to stand and join me in singing. My hope is built on nothing less. Please join me now in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God who came to us in Jesus Christ, companion of the lonely, binder of wounds, seeker of lost souls, friend of the poor, source of all that is, forgiver of sins, voice of the voiceless, counselor of the confused, shelter from the storm, creator of heaven and earth, whom we worship and adore. Amen. Please be seated. Lord Jesus, you are our shepherd. We shall not want. When we're still, even for just a few moments, we recognize that there's nothing else we need. 
that there's nowhere else we need to be, that you have provided for us and blessed us beyond measure. And we recall those blessings even now. Lord Jesus, you are our shepherd. We shall not want. You lead us beside still waters, and you promise to restore our souls. And we lay before you now anything stirring within us that's weighing heavy upon us. We hand you our anxious, worried souls, and we ask you again to lead us to that place of peace. Lead us again on the right path. Even though we walk in the valley of darkness, even though the world around us often feels dark, we see the conflict and the strife in the Ukraine and Russia and Israel in Palestine, even here at home. But even though the valley is dark, we trust that you are with us. And we commend now those in need to your loving care. We ask for wisdom and guidance for ourselves and for our leaders. And even though we walk through the darkest valley, we shall fear no evil, for you are with us. And even in the midst of these dark valleys, we don't have to look very far to see how you have anointed us with blessing and how our cups truly overflow. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell alongside you my whole life long. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as we move into this time of offering, uh, I received, we received a, a thank you note from Habitat for Humanity. It just says, thank you so much for your donation and your continued support of Habitat St. John's. Your gifts will help local hardworking families purchase a safe, secure home. Home ownership will provide them the stability they need to focus on things like career change, school work, and making lifelong memories in a home of their own. We truly appreciate your support. Thanks for all you do. Not, not too long ago, I had the privilege of being at a, a, a ceremony, a housewarming ceremony for one of the residents, and... I remember I was so close to her, I could see the tears kind of coming down her eyes as they handed her to the, key, the keys to her own home. And she told us that this would be the first home that anyone in her family could ever remember actually owning. Your regular giving goes to make this kind of thing possible. We no longer take up a physical offering here, but there are a lot of ways you can give. During the offering, as we get a little flashback into the Christmas season... I invite you to offer again your hearts and lives to Christ.
We, we thank you, O oh God, for the many blessings in our lives. Help us ever to give as we have received. In Christ's name, amen. I invite you now to join me in our singing, our closing hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and every day. Go in peace. Amen.